Well, we're surrounded by um, a lot of different um, views, a lot of different uh, priorities. Uh, people see God, when you mention God, it's like it used to be at some point in the past. Uh, you said God, and everybody kind of knew that it was God. But America, as well as actually pretty much every other country now, is a nation of many gods. Uh, and it's why the apostles had to clarify which God they were talking about. So when you say God, you're referring to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became manifest upon this earth in the person of Jesus Christ, Messiah Yeshua. But when, when you say God, you mean that God. But when the other person many times says God, they're referring to something else. There's this God of new religions. Uh, there's this God of new philosophies, uh, this God that just, you know, is some sort of cosmic vending machine that just spits out whatever you want. Uh, and unfortunately, that idea has filtered its way into some churches as well. The God, but when you think of God, how do you see him? God is seen in many ways. Some people see him as aloof, and harsh. Others see him as caring, generous, light, warmth. Some see him as punishing, angry. Others see him as compassionate, nurturing, so many ways. But when you see God, how do you see him? Okay, source of life. How else? How do you see God? Holy. Okay, holy. Protector. Okay, a protector. Healer. What's that? Healer. Okay, a healer. I mean. Forgiving. Forgiving. Aren't you glad? Yes. Because Hashem. So, but what what is God in actuality? Is he any of those things? All. He's all those things, and so many other things that we that we see him as. And so we begin to see that God is not the God of a human creation. I mean, he's not a God who wants you to have everything to make you happy. Uh, God is a God who loves and is love. What does God ask of his people? Okay, obedience. What else? Faith, to love him. Uh, he, he asks something of us. Well, why do you think God wants us to be obedient? Just because he likes obedience? He wants us to live. Okay, he wants us to live. You give a commandment to your, to your child. You say, child, don't touch the hot oven. Because you know that if a child does this, it's going to become injured and damaged. In fact, if they put their hand in the oven, there's a chance that, that they can become, that, 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 that hand will become deformed. God gives us the commandments he started building on the foundation of the ten, filtering out into the other ordinances that were all for one purpose. Two purposes. To love him and to love people. And so when God gives us those commandments, it's not to say, can you imagine saying to God, but God, I want to burn my hand in the oven. That would be insane. And yet we do because we don't understand when your child was two, did the child understand the same thing as when they were 12 or 16 or 24? No, you, you, a child grows in understanding in order to appreciate what the parent has, has taught us. Our God is like that. We don't understand some of these things sometimes. And maybe you've been a believer for 40 years. That's why we need God to be able to guide us. God wants his people to be pure and holy set aside, and that's what sanctified is. is, is it's a separation from what? Sin, the world. Uh, um, and so God is doing this for you. If you turn over to the book of Daniel, please. God is, is constantly giving us insights so that we will be and become even more like him. Daniel chapter 12 Daniel chapter 12, and it says uh, in verse 1, At that time, Michael shall stand up. And who is this? Archangel. Okay, the archangel Michael. Uh, tradition says that an archangel was appointed for the nations of the, of the earth, that the archangel Michael was appointed for the nation of Israel. 
At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered. And everyone who's found, uh, whose name is found, sorry, everyone who is found written in the book, and as many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the, the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever, will shine. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. For many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Sound familiar? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have, at this point, access to more knowledge than I think any other point in history that I'm aware of. Just at a push of a button, at a, at a, at a, at a flick of a, of a page. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there saw, or there were stood two others, one on his river bank and the other on that river bank. And the one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the earth, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a times, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, and all these things shall be finished." Although I heard it and not understand, and I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the end of time. Many shall be purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days." Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise into your inheritance at the end of time, or the end of days. God refines his people. It's why he punished us throughout the various points of history of, of Israel. Um, I, I know of, I can't think of any other religious book where we celebrate the fact that God didn't destroy us. But we are. We celebrate that because we were ignorant and rebellious people, the Jewish people, and those that have been grafted into Israel through the blood of Messiah. He's purifying his people. And why do you think he does this? What is the purpose of purification? Preparation. Okay, preparation, cleansing. Unrighteousness can't exist in his presence. Okay, unrighteousness. Um, this purification, uh, Job 23. It does. <laughs> it does. That that would um, that that'd be for for a different discussion, but yeah. But there there was certainly yeah. Yeah. Job. So who was Job? Was he Jewish? No. No. Okay, a man of God. Um, so let me ask you this: um, in in our present days, there's a philosophy uh, masquerading as a theology that says God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wise, right? Um, you got to you have you deserve everything, and it's just up to you to ask for it, because God wants you to have everything. What's that roughly called? What's it? Greed. Okay. Uh, so God says, do, do you do you find that? from the beginning to the end, that if, if for some reason you don't have everything that you want, or you're sick, that somehow God is punishing you for that? Um, if everything is perfect in your life and, there's, and there's, there's, there's nothing going wrong, that somehow you're blessed. Um, here's a man who experienced, I don't know, would you say a, a little bit of suffering? <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe a, a trial or, or, or two? Um, what did Job lose? Everything. 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 Except what? He, he lost everything. He then says, and this is Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. One. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter, and my hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. And I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me, 
he would answer and say to me, would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. Then the upright would reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, and he is not there. And backward, I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I shall take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as what? Gold. Gold. This metaphor is used from beginning to the end of the purification of the righteous. We're not righteous because we are perfect. We're righteous because of what God is doing in us and by his grace. Um, When gold or any kind of mineral or metal, precious metal, is dug out of the earth, it comes with a bunch of stuff. What is that? Dross, schmutz, um, stuff. Uh, Can you imagine having um, a beautiful ring made out of schmutzy gold? Hey, it's a nice looking ring you got there. Ooh, some nice schmutz. Can, I mean, that, that would be silly. Uh, you want the purest gold that, that you can afford. Um, you want the, the most beautiful. And, and so the dross or the impurities are, are, are not beautiful. And so the purpose of the refining process is to remove those so that you can have the finest gold or silver. And it's this process by which we see physical um, metaphors carrying over into the spiritual. He says that I shall come forth as gold, for my foot has held fast to his steps, and I have kept his way and not turned aside, for I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Uh, and here we go with the words of the Lord are more precious than the things of this earth. And we have to be those that understand his words so that we can begin to understand his ways. If we are experiencing trials, um, are we following in the footsteps of the prophets? Are we following in the footsteps of the apostles? Are we following in the footsteps of the martyrs, those who, who gave their lives, who did not have an easy life? If the prosperity gospel, which is so present today, is true, then Jesus failed, Paul failed, and all the apostles failed because they did not have everything they wanted, nor did they live a life free of trials. In this life, he says in the book of the Apocalypse, you shall have tribulation. Is that the end of the story? But be of good cheer. Take courage. Because the courage that we have does not come from our own eyes, which are constantly looking at all the troubles of our own or others, and we're dismayed. Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. God tests us. Does he tempt us? Nope. But he does test us. He he provides us opportunities to overcome what? People? Overcome uh, what? Situations. Okay. Ourselves and passions and yes, overcome situations. Um, We have to be those that understand his ways so that we will appreciate his his work. Know his words so we can appreciate his ways. Did the sorry? Did the uh, the the psalmist say something to the effect of his hand was heavy upon me? And what do you think that means? When when David said his hand is heavy upon me, Um, was that an embrace? It was a discipline. discipline. Yeah, Yeah, it was. He God's when God's hand is heavy upon us. It's he's trying to get our attention. Oh, that we would hear. And understand his ways. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And and verse 2. It says that in that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. 
Who's the branch? Yeshua. Yeshua, that's right. Shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. For when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and has purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud that is smoked by day and a shifting, uh, sorry, a shining of flame by night. For over all the glory will be a covering. Spirit of burning. Um, what is that a metaphor or what is it relating to? Okay. Okay. A furnace. Yeah. Um, what is the spirit of burning? Yeah. It, it's the purifying of his people. Uh, the spirit of burning is the purification of us from outward things and purification of the inward of our hearts. The external events and situations are for the purification of the inside of us. Uh, when you have gold that is mixed with impurities, uh, can you wish that to be better and, and, and more pure? What does it take to actually purify that gold? Burn it out. Okay, burn it out. It takes heat. It takes things that, it takes action to be able to accomplish what you desire in that gold. And likewise, it takes that, the same for us in this life. So we see that this spirit of burning, which is God, it is the spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, when he comes upon us uh, and, he, and he moves in us, it's for only one reason. And what is that reason? Draw us closer to him. Okay, to draw us closer to him for life. When you wish the best for your children, sometimes you have to discipline them because. But sometimes you also have to do something else as they get older. And what, what is something like that that we might say? Something that they're old, older, what do you have to do at some point? Take your hands off and let them make their own mistakes. You let them see and experience so that they too will come to and their own faith, their own experience of God. That they, no one stands upon the shoulders of another in faith. We impart things to our children and to those, but each person has to have their own faith. We see that in over in the same book, chapter 48, Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48 and verse 10. The prophet says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver, for I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, I will do it about how should my name be profaned and I will not give my glory to another. He's tested us in the furnace of affliction. Does that sound fun? I think that's going to sell a whole lot of books and tapes and CDs and DVDs and um, podcasts. Affliction. Pick me! Is that going to sell a whole lot? No, 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 no. What sells is appealing to people's passions and people's uh, lusts and all the things that you know, are so much easier. Affliction is the process by which we become pure. He says, I will not give my glory to another. What do you think that means? He has to be pure to share his glory. Okay. Have to be pure to share his glory. When, when God says he wants his people to be a holy priesthood, He's not saying it's a nice thing to say. He's saying that he wants his people to be holy, like, like he is holy. He will not give power and authority to someone who is not ready for it. He will not share his throne with an unbeliever. He purifies us so that we will also be able to withstand his 
presence. Um, what does the scripture say that our God is? Okay, a jealous God? It says that our God is a consuming fire. Is that just a nice phrase? Ooh, that's, oh, I like that. I, I should put that on a coffee cup. It, if, if he's a consuming fire, then what do you think it takes to stand in the presence? Okay, material that won't burn. Uh, you got to get gold really hot to burn, don't you? And to melt even. Um, he desires his people to be like pure gold. Do you feel like pure gold right now? I want to feel like that, but I'm not. I know that there's still some dross and some things that, that need to be removed. Uh, when he says, we'll read it in a little bit, to come and present your bodies as, as a living sacrifice, what were some of the criteria of the sacrifice that were to be offered in, in the temple and later, the tabernacle later, the temple. Okay. And so he wants the same thing. If we are to be living sacrifices for him, then we must be in that place, in that state, and that takes the journey. Uh, Malachi, the book of the prophet Malachi, chapter 3. study Bible. All right. Malachi chapter 3. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will come suddenly to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. And behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like the launderer's soap. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as silver and gold, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Um, this is an, an image of a, a coming time in which... Uh, it's like, who's going to be, appear before God at the, at the throne? What's that? Everybody will appear before God. At that point... Something happens. And what is that? Separation. Okay, the separation of the sheep and the goats, the left hand and the right hand. Um, we see that there is there's criteria for being one or, or, or well, being one of one of the two, I should say. And so, uh, the righteousness of, of God. Can any of us say to ourselves, "I got it because I did it"? Um, no. We do that because he has made us and given us this. None, no man can say, I did this by myself, can they? When, when one of us, or a person would say, I have done this, what are they saying? God have mercy on us. He wants his people to be those that hear the voice of, of his spirit and, and, and call and respond to him. The book of Romans. We see that this theme is all throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the foundational testament, as well as into the new covenant. Uh, Romans chapter 12.
Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. For do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me that everyone who thinks among you not ought to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, for to think soberly, soberly means what? Okay, truthfully, um, clearly, clear-mindedly. As God has dealt to each a measure of faith, but as we have many members in one body, but not all, not all members have the same function. So we being many are one body in Messiah, and individually members of one another. For having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Ministry, let us use it. Ministry, uh, in our ministry, he who teaches in teaching, he exhorts in exhortation. He who gives uh, with liber liberality or freedom, then he leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. For let love be without hypocrisy, and abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate towards one another with a brotherly love, in honor giving preference to another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Um, how in tribulation? Patience. Um, a perseverance. Did he say, the apostle, or any of the apostles in the writings, just, just become a believer and you have everything all figured out and everything's going to be cool and kosher and smooth? And um, If anybody believes that, then they probably should read uh, the varieties of the other books that are in the scriptures. Uh, how did the, the apostle Paul die? He suffered, but he endured. Um, how, did, how did the Apostle Peter repose? He was crucified. But he said, don't crucify me like my Lord was crucified. Crucify me in this way or a different way. Uh, each of the apostles gave their lives for the faith. They would not compromise because they, they didn't seek even the, the, the praise of those who they served. The only desired was to, to serve God. Rukhashim. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Therefore, it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, practicing holiness in the fear of God. Holiness and the fear of God. What, what does the fear of God mean? Wisdom. Okay. Wisdom. Um, how different would, would we be if we actually believed in the awe and the fear of God? Um, what's that? Better behaved. Better behaved. Uh, we would be different people. Ruch Hashem, we can choose that today, right now. Um, how do we know and understand? Bless you. Uh, what does it take to, to know and to be able to understand the things as they occur in our lives? Are you going to understand the reason behind every single thing? When we experience trials and, and adversities, and we all do and, and we have, um, is it scary and disorienting? Um, what should we do in those times when we are all overcome? Pray. What else? Get trust. Um, stones are not useful until they're broken and shaped. 
A big rock doesn't, doesn't make a house, doesn't make a temple. He says, you are living stones. Uh, he says that you're fitted and we have to be broken and then shaped so that we can be useful. Uh, and when we become useful in his eyes, it is beautiful. He's Baruch Hashem. He is something that is so perfect. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. In verse 12, he says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And he who is, sorry, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? For even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. He says that. It's, it's about our trust in Him. Um, when I become dismayed by whatever it is, I have to return to the fact of who God is. Um, who is God to you? Who is He? Friend and father. Okay, friend and father. Who is He? Is, is he an idea, uh, a philosophy? Um, he, he is the source of all of our life, all of our hope. A life without Christ is a life that is empty, seeking. Uh, everybody has the God-shaped hole, and everybody will try to fit whatever it can in there to stop the pain or, the, or to numb it. And so we who are believers, we experience trials which are for a purpose. Suffering without Christ is simply suffering. Suffering with him and for him and, and, and in his life in us, it is for a higher good which will reap great rewards. Will we, will we see those rewards in this life? Maybe a little bit of it. But it's like comparing uh, getting like, like, like a $500 payout to a multi-billion dollars payout. You want, the, you want the payout now? 500 bucks, I mean. The, the monetary number is just to describe an, an immeasurable wealth of experience where there is no sorrow, there are no tears, there is only beautiful experiences in his presence and fellowship with those who are there. Brothers and sisters, Prakashim. Chapter 5 of the same book. Chapter 5 and verse 9. Well, let's, let's do uh, chapter, sorry, verse 8. Chapter, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in truth, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brothers and sisters in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Messiah Yeshua, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish strength and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Called us to his eternal glory. A verse or so back, he says, God will not share his glory with those who are not prepared. God gave, in, in, in a way that is mysterious and we don't understand, He gave the throne to Messiah. And what does Messiah say to you and to me? He says, I want you to share this with me. I'm not here for myself. I want you to share this with me. Hashem. And so to share in that glory, we have to be those who are being perfected. Not perfect, like we think of, but growing and becoming mature in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 
1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones and wood, hay and straw, that each one's work shall become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And that fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as though through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So what does this this passage say? Our work, our action in this life and in this world are, are, are varying degrees of substance. So what does this say? What else? How else could we say that or see that? When we stand before God, what does He do for all people? Does He go, Yep, come on in. Yep, come on in. Yeah, you. Yeah, come on in. Come on in. Or does He weigh our actions in there? Um, he weighs. Will we be rewarded based upon our actions? Yeah. He says even right here that we will have some work that is not pure. And Baruch Hashem, that will be consumed. But he says that even so, with some of that, we will still be saved. He's saying this for us to have hope, saying this for us to say to ourselves, can you judge yourself in the sense of of knowing what your work is? Should you judge yourself? If we do, then we're going to be off a whole lot of the times because we're awesome, right? Yep. And he's saying that to judge our continuing actions. If we do something that is good, can we say, wow, I'm sure glad I did something good? What is filtered in, in, into a, a righteous action or a good action that can make it unrighteous? Motive, Motive intention. Uh, you can give a million dollars, you can build a hospital after you, and you can have your name on it. Wouldn't you like that? But if you gave it simply because you wanted your name on the hospital or because you just like to hear people talk about you. Is that a righteous action? Probably not. I mean, again, only truly God knows. He is the judge. We can't judge other people for why they gave that million dollars. It's not up to us. That isn't our work. That's not our job. Our job is to govern this. If they gave the million dollars, then Baruch Hashem. I don't care why they gave it to it. That's not between me and them. It's between them and God. I don't have the right to judge their motivation for that. But he says that on that day, everyone's work will be made manifest. What does he also say, which is absolutely terrifying? On that day, when you stand before Christ, he says, you're going to give account of what? God have mercy on me, a sinner. Spend time reflecting. And you won't be able to remember that all. But reflect on what you have thought, what you have done, what you have said. And seek to say, God, forgive me of this. God, forgive me of this. I want to be pure and stand before you. And, oh, Lord, I know I'm not. Um, Does God say, eh, It'd be nice if you did, but you're never going to make it. Is that what he says to us? No, the saints are cheering us on. They're saying, you can do this. We were imperfect, just like you. 
We sinned just like you. We walked and we fell and we, we arose again. And we were found standing at the time in which we left this earth. God measures righteousness a whole lot different than you and I do. Hashem, that even people like me and you, that we can be found righteous, is his miracles. The refining fire of our God. The, the Bible repeatedly professes and the fathers continuously teach that God is love. He is love and nothing else. And therefore, because he is perfect and holy and pure, humanity experiences him in whatever state of mind they are found. To the godly ones, he is beautiful, guiding, healing, and glorious. To the wicked, he is seen as harsh, punishing, and fearful. For this is the meaning of the psalm. To the pure, you show yourself pure. And to the devious, you show yourself devious. For each person will experience God as they themselves are found. May we rush to purify ourselves so that we can reflect his abiding love and glory. James chapter 1, and we'll finish here. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man or woman who endures temptation, for when they have been approved, they will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to everyone? To those who love him. Let no one say, I am tempted, that I am tempted by God, for God cannot tempt, sorry, be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each is tempted when he is drawn away by his, his own desires and enticed. We know the pattern. It becomes a thought, and then it becomes an obsession, and then it becomes an action. But he says, to those who endure will receive this crown. What do you think it means to endure? Is, does that sound pleasant? Um, I mean, eating a big bowl of ice cream, is that an... Is that enduring? I mean, oh well, I guess I'll persevere here. Uh, how about a big, nice bowl of, like, kale? No dressing. Just a bunch of leaves. Um, do you think you'd endure that? Or persevere through it? It's great, I'm enjoying it. No, endurance means that there, it's a challenge. If you persevere, it means it's not pleasant. It's, it's, it's something that is, 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 is there. Uh, if you climb Mount Everest, um, is it a cakewalk? Is it you go, yeah, this is really good. Um, I'm enjoying myself. No, people persevere through great trials so they can come out victorious. And our God says, if you endure and persevere, and if you embrace me and what I am, then you too will be able to share this with me. And so this is our journey. We experience the fires of refinement and tribulation so that we will also be prepared. God will say to us one of two things. Well done, or depart from me. I don't want to hear the second one. I don't want you to hear the second one. I wish that no one would have to hear that. That God is a consuming fire and we will experience it in one of those two ways. So may you and I be dil diligent and lay aside all earthly cares so that we may be found in that time that we can share eternity with our God. Amen. We thank you, Father, that you love us so much that you hold tenaciously to us and you won't let us go, O oh Lord. Thank you, as someone who's wandered away from you, that you brought me back. O oh, our God, please, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to be found, standing with you and in you on that day, may you do for each of us. We thank you for having loved humanity so much that you would sacrifice and come and be with us and walk with us and eat with us and cry with us and bleed for us. 
As we look and coming towards Passover, O oh Lord, may your sacrifice in that time become even more precious to us each passing year. We love you and thank you and ask this in the name of the Holy King, Messiah Yeshua, our King and our God. Amen.